Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on NSF Annual and Project Outcome Reports, Demystifying Preparations. This webinar is offered by Mentor Connect in coordination with the South Carolina Advanced Technological Education Center. Before we get started, if you haven't already done so, please use the chat box to introduce yourself and also let us know if there are any other viewers in the room with you. If you have questions, please ask them in the chat. We will have question breaks during the webinar and we'll also answer some questions in the chat. Most of you have used Zoom by, for a long time now, but remember, you can change your view in the upper right-hand corner where the three dots are. Registered participants will receive a link to the re webinar recording. You will also receive an email with any attachments that are shared in the chat. The link and chat attachments are typically ready within one week of broadcast. There will also be a quick reference guide based on the webinar published in the resource library of mentor-connect.org. This tutorial will include the PowerPoint slides with annotated text. If you would like to receive a certificate of completion for attending the webinar, please email mentor-connect at fdtc.edu. Make sure you include your name as you would like it to appear on the certificate and identify which webinar you attended, in this case, the annual reports webinar. Now I would like to introduce Elaine Kraft, who is Principal Investigator for the Mentor Connect Leadership Development and Outreach for AT project. Emery DeWitt is a project manager and co-PI of the Mentor Connect project. And we are delighted to welcome Kaylin Owens, who is an NSF program officer. And I am Pamela Silvers, a co-PI for the Mentor Connect project. Today's agenda includes an overview of NSF reporting requirements and how to monitor these requirements in research.gov. We will take a deep dive into preparation of annual reports, including how your project evaluation and how the annual re and how the evaluator's report becomes part of your annual report to NSF. Last, we will review requirements for the outcomes report, which you will need to prepare as your project comes to an end. Now, Emory will launch a poll so that we can find out how much, a little bit about you and how much report writing experience you have. Next slide, Emory. Don't know if Emory, okay. So what NSF reports have you previously created? An annual report, an outcomes report, I'm an evaluator and have created evaluation reports or none? Okay. Um. End the poll and share the results. Wow. For many of you, the information we're discussing today is going to be new to you. In fact, 70% of the attendees. I hope this information will relieve some anxiety as you complete this requirement. This webinar focuses on providing advice you need to prepare and submit reports that meet NSF expectations. For those of you with reporting experience, you may have wondered if you're doing them right or how you could improve your reports. We hope this information helps you too. And for those evaluators in the audience, I applaud you for seeking a better understanding of PI reporting requirements and the critical role that, eva that evaluators have in this process. And now, welcome Kaylin, who's going to talk about report requirements from the NSF perspective. Yes, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you to Mentor Connect for organizing this wonderful webinar. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of very um, useful information throughout the webinar, so very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mentor Connect. Um, so you, you might be wondering why and maybe who uh, the annual reports or the reporting is for um, and, and why we ask you to do it. So, and so the first thing to know is that definitely it is required. So if you are a recipient of an NSF uh, award, then you're required um, to submit regular reports to NSF. And we'll talk about the different types of reports in just a moment. 
Um, NSF utilizes this information in a number of different ways. It informs project improvements or program improvements, uh, as well as um, for you know, larger uh, evaluation and monitoring efforts um, across the agency. So really important. Uh, these, these reports are, are, are very important. Um, a few things about the reports, only principal investigators and, and, and co-PIs, so PIs and co-PIs can create and edit and submit the project report. So it's really on the PI's plate to be sure that reporting um, takes place and in a timely fashion. Um, your sponsored project office or AOR um, are allowed or are have access to uh, the reports, but in a user only view. Um, so just know that as the PI and co-PI, um, you are responsible for those reports. So there are really three types of reports. Um, the annual report is the most common and we're abbreviating, abbreviating that as APR. This is a report that's submitted every year of an award and must describe the activities of the project during the year of the reporting period. So we'll talk a little bit more about the timeline in just a moment, um, but ultimately you you're need to be thinking about capturing what's happening in your project throughout the, the duration of your award um, and reporting on it every year, so through an annual report. There's then something called a final project report or an FPR, and these are submitted at the end of the project, as you might assume from the name. Uh, and they're, so they're, the key thing about these is that they are very similar to annual reports. In fact, you're reporting just on the very last year. So there's some confusion with uh, final reports and thinking that they may need to be comprehensive, but actually they're just reports capturing that final year of the project. Um, and then finally, project outcomes report. These are actually due at the same time as the final project report. Uh, they're, so they're submitted at the completion of the project. It's They're for the general public and should be written in a manner that is accessible and to a broad audience. There's examples of these on the website. So each project, once it is finished, um, has an, a project outcomes report posted to uh, the, you know, the website at NSF. Here's that timeline I was referring to. So um, a, a few things to know about this. If you take a look at the, the image there, um, you'll note at the far left of the blue box is when the award starts. Uh, and then a, about nine, well, exactly 90 days uh, to the end of that first year is when your project report, your first annual project report becomes due. So it's really only been nine months and that can cause some confusion initially if you're just getting started, which it looked like from the poll, there's quite a number of you that are just getting started. So please know that you'll start to get reminders uh, at the nine month mark or about 90 days uh, to the end of the budget period uh, about your report being due. It doesn't become overdue until the, the one year mark. So you have about a three month window there, 90 day window there to um, finish and complete and submit your report. If you do not submit your report, then it becomes overdue. So the APR becomes overdue uh, and you'll begin to get notices about that. A few things about the reminders, PIs and AORs are gonna receive email reminders every 30 days during this during the period uh, at the 90, from the 90 day mark, 90 day to the end of the budget period to the end of the budget period. During that time zone, you're gonna receive um, email reminders uh, every 30 days. And again, that doesn't just go to the PIs, it goes to other um, uh, administrators or AORs at your, whoever signed up at, uh, at your institution to receive those emails. All right, next slide, yes, thank you. So um, in terms of overdue projects, uh, uh, you want to make sure that you try to avoid overdue projects um, because these can de cause delays on a number of fronts. So if your institution or somebody else that you're a, a co-PI on the on the project is aiming to, uh, you know, is or is applying for more funding, then that could be delayed. And so um, the system gets tied up if there's any sort of uh, overdue reports. Um, so you want to be sure it will delay most things that you want to do for all the co-PIs and PIs involved in the project. 
Thank you, Kaylin, for that yes. great <laughs> overview of annual reports. Now I'm going to drill down a little bit into how you log in and how you access your annual reports. In the upper right-hand corner, uh, of the main page of research.gov, you'll enter your login name and password. And so next slide. Your login name and password is the same that you've used for other activities in the past, such as your proposal submission. Note that if you've forgotten your login or password, you can click for appropriate assistance. This is something that I have found I needed to write down because you don't use it a lot, but when you need it, you're going, what is my login again or something? So I write it down and have it a place that I can find it. After logging in, you'll see the award and reporting option in the middle of the screen. You're going to click on the project report button. There is a demo that provides training. There's also a template that you can download if you want. The first thing that I do is download the template, which we can put in the chat also, but I can review the questions that are going to re be asked and reflect on them. For those of you who got a notice on April 1st, this is your first step I would encourage you to do is download the template and see what you're going to be asked. However, if you put the information in the template, you are still going to have to copy and paste it into the boxes in research.gov. I tend to type my information in a blank Word document, so I'm not getting any additional information in it. So I use a template to see what the questions are, but I type my information just in a blank Word document. When you click on Project Report, you'll see a screen that gives you the information about your report. If you have multiple projects, you're going to see multiple listings, so you want to make sure that you pick the correct award, award number. Other items listed are the award title, the type of report, whether it's an annual report or your final incomes outcomes report, which we'll talk about later. Next are the status and the days until due. The report over date, over due date will coincide with the month and day of your award date. The last tab allows you to create and edit your report. Until you submit your report, you can edit it. You want to pay attention to the report status indicator. Before the 90 day mark, it will list the report as not yet due. During the 90 day, it will list due. Obviously, you don't want a report listed as overdue. The report overdue date is shown on the dashboard. And after submission, you will see under review, which means your report has been submitted and is under review by your program officer. And the one you want to see is approved. After you submit your report to NSF, you will receive an email acknowledging the receipt of your report. And now Elaine's going to talk about some of the details that are required and what the different boxes are that you need to fill in. Thank you, Pam. The first information requested in the reporting template is about project goals. You should enter your goals directly from your project proposal. This is an area where it is possible to cut and paste to answer the question. The goals you list should not change from those presented in your funded proposal unless your program officer has approved a change. The next section of the report is where you write about your accomplishments. This section gives you an opportunity to share with your program officer all that you have done and accomplished in the reporting period. Accomplishments are broken down into four categories. The categories are major activities, specific objectives, significant results, and key outcomes or other achievements. You must provide information in at least one of the four categories, but use as many categories as appropriate to fully report what you've been accomplishing. It may be that the number of reporting categories you use changes by reporting year. For your first year report, for example, you may have started a number of activities, but at the time you prepare your report, you may not have any key outcomes to report. In addition, you will be asked the questions on this slide. What training and professional development have you provided? How have you shared your work with others? And what do you plan to do next to accomplish your goals? When describing what you will do next, indicate how what you have learned during the current reporting period will guide your next steps. Next steps should always be informed by the work you've already accomplished and what you have learned about what works and what doesn't. Describe any adjustments you will make and where possible, tie these decisions 
to your evaluation data and evaluators report. When reporting on project activities, be specific and provide metrics where you can, who and how many participated. Participant demographics, types of participants such as students, prospective students, high school teachers, two-year college faculty, industry partners, or parents. If you want to share copies of agendas, evaluation surveys, recruitment flyers, or similar items associated with your activities and accomplishments, the reporting system allows attachments to be uploaded. Regarding sharing your project information, describe any local, regional, statewide, or national events or publications where you have shared information about your work. This could include speaking to a faculty group or board of trustees at your institution, conducting a workshop, speaking or exhibiting at a national conference, being interviewed for a local news article, or publishing a paper. The more you advance with your project, the more you will have to share with others. As a result, parts of your annual report will become more robust over the life of the project. At the end of the accomplishments section is where you upload your evaluator's report. Unfortunately, the reporting system does not make this clear. This is the first opportunity in the system to upload a document. So use this opportunity for this purpose as your program officer will be expecting to see the report to be included in this location. You will see the place where you can upload a document with instructions. You will need to type in the name of the document that you're uploading, such as 2024 External Evaluation Report. And then select the PDF file from your computer and upload. In order to have your evaluation report to upload when you need it, your evaluator should be given a deadline with sufficient advance notice. Notice on the reporting timeline, a red arrow has been added to indicate when you should request your annual evaluation report from your evaluator. Evaluators depend on the project for certain information, so make sure that you're doing your part to support on-time completion of your external evaluation report. Be diligent about securing and properly sharing any information that your evaluator requests for evaluation work. Products of your project cover a wide range of things, such as website, webinar, conference paper, curriculum, or journal art. Products are typically standalone items that can be accessed and are used by others. This screen shows selection options when reporting on products. Some items, like a recorded webinar, are not listed as options and thus require reporting under the other category. Each item is reported separately. Depending on how many items you have to report, it can take some time to complete this portion of the report. The next section of the report is participants. This is where you will report the time worked by the project PI and co-PIs and the contribution of partnering organizations during the year. For the PI and co-PI, you will provide the nearest person months work which may require rounding to provide a single digit response. In addition, you will be asked to describe each person's contribution to the project, their funding support, which is typically NSFATE, and you will be asked if there has been any change in active other support for the individual, which may trigger the need to update the person's current and pending support form. Other questions are whether or not the person has been involved in international collaboration, or has participated in international travel. For each participating organization you list, you will need to provide the name of the organization, the type of organization, and the location of the organization. As with the PI and co-PI, you will also need to describe the partner's contribution to the project. An extra text box is provided to provide more detail on the partner and contribution, should that be appropriate. For example, an organization overall may support the project in specific ways, and then an individual within the organization may provide additional contributions that you can describe in the second text box. The impact
There we go. The impact section of the report is another area where your response may be limited with your first report, but will likely become more substantial over time. Don't be concerned if you indicate nothing to report in several of the options provided in this section. We've included all of the options for reporting impacts on the next slide. You are not required to supply information for all of these questions. An optional response to each question is nothing to report. However, I encourage you to give these questions consideration and include any information that helps describe the benefits deriving from your project and its impact in the context of the questions being asked. I find that this section makes me think about my work more broadly. I hope that you too will reflect on what you're doing and how this work may have impacts beyond the immediate circle of people who are actively engaged with or being served by your project. This section is for reporting major changes or significant problems during the reporting period. No project will unfold exactly as planned, and there's no expectation that you will report every challenge you've encountered or adjustment that has been made during the reporting period. This section is for reporting bigger things like a change in grant personnel, particularly a PI or co-PI, changes in a partner with a significant role in the project, or a major change in how you will be implementing the project or a problem encountered that is preventing you from implementing the project as planned or when planned. For example, when COVID hit, many programs had to quickly switch from in-person to virtual activities. Others had to rethink all of their on-site outreach activities involving high schools. These were major changes for a project that would need to be reported in this section. It is important to understand that if a change or a problem is significant enough to be reported here, you should have already been in communication with your program officer about it. Program officers should not learn about these issues for the first time when they read it in your annual report. Other changes or problem categories are not likely to be applicable to ATE grants. It is okay to indicate that these are not applicable or that you have nothing to report. As Kayla mentioned earlier, report timing can be very confusing. Reports become due 90 days before the anniversary of your grant start date. On that date, the report is passed to due. Automated messages stating that your annual report is due are sent beginning 90 days before the conclusion of the first grant year, and this repeats annually thereafter. Your report should be submitted within the 90-day time frame, preferably closer to the beginning than to the end of the time frame. You do not want to submit your report at the last minute. The report is not considered accepted until your project uh, program officer has read and approved the report. Program officers have a large portfolio of projects, all sending in annual reports, so they need time to get this work done. Also, program officers sometimes ask the PI for more information prior to approving the report. Any back and forth exchange like this must all be completed before the anniversary date or your report will be past due, which has a number of negative ramifications, as Kalen pointed out earlier. We think the optimal time to submit is six weeks to one month before your grant anniversary date. Set your internal team deadline for submission, alert your evaluator of your plan, and get your report done on time. The NSF report due notifications are sent to your AOR at the institution in addition to the PI, so you will want to be in communication with your AOR so that this person knows that you have a plan for meeting the reporting requirement. The reporting template sets parameters for the amount of content that may be submitted in each text box. Your content will need to be edited to fit if you exceed the character limits that have been set. The template also explains the limits on attachments. A second opportunity to upload attachments is provided. You will recall that the first opportunity is where you should upload your evaluation report. When you have another opportunity to upload documents, 
If you choose to do so, you will need to adhere to the file size limitations as indicated. Start early preparing your annual report. There are quite a few sections to complete and you will likely need to include information that must be researched or gathered from others. The report does not need to be completed at one time, so go ahead and get portions of the report done as you have the information available to do so. One final comment about your report, which is made up of your report and your evaluation report. These two reports should differ. Don't copy your evaluation report as your report. Also, it is not your evaluator's job to prepare your annual report. Your program officer will be looking for different insights on how your project is progressing, one internal and one external. Each report should be unique, but the two reports should align. You and your evaluator want to avoid reporting conflicting information or data for your project. So now we're going to go back to Kalen for some report expectations from the NSF perspective. Thank you, Elaine. So some expectations from NSF's perspective are first and foremost that you're utilizing that evaluator's report to inform your own reporting efforts. And uh, Elaine did a wonderful job of providing an overview of that, but I will say that it is one of the number one reasons why a report is returned and, and asked to be resubmitted. So please remember that you need to address information and recommendations from your evaluator, as well as include the evaluator's report in each annual report that you submit. That's the number one reason why, why these reports are, are returned. Um, we also, uh, as Elaine mentioned, want to make sure that you are discussing the challenges, the changes, um, and any of those impediments that altered or interfered with your progress. The, we, it's important that you know that, well, that you know that NSF knows that um, changes are going to happen, and uh, mostly we just want to uh, hear about them and know how you're addressing them in these annual reports. Um, so please be sure to discuss those. We also um, want to make sure that you include information about the contribution to the project for each listed member of the team. Elaine went over this. There is a section in the uh, report uh, template for you to enter this information. And we just want to make sure you don't skip over it because we do see that on occasion. Uh, and we really would like you to include this information. Uh, and finally, a couple of more points here. Revising reporting fields is important. So we want to make sure that you're updating your report from the previous year. We do on occasion, uh, you know, look back at old reports to see how things have progressed. And we want to make sure that you're updating all the information in each um, subsequent annual report. Of course, um, you want to include those attachments. So any supporting documentation um, is important to include. There's a place to upload documents. So please feel free to, to upload documents that you think will um, convey the, the progress of your, of your project and um, support uh, the work that it is that you're doing. And then, of course, as I think we've all three mentioned at this point, um, be sure to submit your report on time. You will receive um, very annoying emails reminding you that your report is overdue uh, if it gets into that time frame. All right, in terms of challenges and unforeseen changes, uh, Elaine mentioned a number of these. Uh, I think it's important for you to know that from NSF's perspective, or, or I guess what we'll, I'll say is, NSF's um, awards are considered grants, um, not contracts. So we know that changes are going to happen and that you're going to need to change course um, and make changes to your budgets, make changes to your activities. Uh, and this happens on pretty much every project uh, that we fund. So please know that the, the that NSF knows that th this is happening and that this is part of the process. So these could be changes in, in things like faculty training. Um, maybe when you put your proposal together, you had some idea of what that would entail, but things changed and now you need something different there. And that might impact travel as well. 
um, it, issues and, and challenges with your business office uh, could delay the work that you're doing. And so this might can be considered an unforeseen change um, in your timeline. Unexpected financial costs are also another um, uh, thing that comes up quite often. So, you know, just know that you can move things around in your budget and that you're just documenting this uh, and communicating with your program officer. Equipment as, falls in that same category. Um, and then uh, things like an evaluator site visit uh, is something that you might want to be thinking about before you submit your proposal. But um, if not, then that's something that you can discuss with your program officer and also discuss in your annual report. Um, and PIs and co-PIs leaving the institution, that does happen on occasion. So that's another change that that um, we that we often see and and is is expected and just it should be documented in your in your annual report as Elaine mentioned earlier. Great, and I want to talk just about some of the things that um, you need to keep in mind and mistakes to avoid. Uh, you want your report to reflect well on your team, your college, and the work that ATE funding is making possible. This is your opportunity to provide your program officer with an insider's view of your project. Don't get lazy. It is not acceptable to submit last year's report again as if you had not done anything new in the reporting period. Grant activities may repeat in some ways year after year, but there will always be changes. So you want each report to be fresh and reflective of the current reporting period's experiences, outcomes, and lessons learned. You may not include individual student names in your report, so be very careful not to do that. If you wanna to refer to a student or students, just say a student or our students or something like that, but do not name students in your report. Your report will be returned to you without being approved if you fail to attach your evaluator's report, as Kaylin mentioned. So don't submit your report without it and without commenting and responding to uh, things that are in that evaluation report. Make certain that you address the information uh, from your evaluator. The evaluator is designed, or evaluation is designed to help improve projects. You are expected to use this information being collected and analyzed to help you make program improvements and achieve better outcomes. Discuss in your portion of the report how you're doing this. Program officers understand that no project unfolds exactly as planned. Very often, it is what we learn through our mistakes and from things that didn't work that improve our approaches and lead us to the best discoveries, solutions, and outcomes. Don't feel that you can only report the good things that have happened with your project. It's okay to include things that you tried that did not go as planned. What is important is that what you learned and what changes you will make going forward to achieve your goals. Here are a few more tips for success with your annual report. You will want to cut and paste information into the reporting template to the extent possible. Then print and review your report before submitting. Your program officer will appreciate a report that is well done and free of careless errors. Pay attention to your due dates and plan your work accordingly. Don't report major changes or significant problems without communicating in advance with your program officer about these things prior to the submission of your annual report. If you have difficulty submitting information in the reporting template, switch browsers and try again. I personally had difficulty reporting PI and co-PI time when using Firefox, but then I had no difficulty when I re-entered the system using Google Chrome. Now, let's stop for a minute and see if you have any questions. Well, I'll have to say that if you all have been watching the chat, we have a lot of questions. I think this is reflective of having 70% um, of people never having submitted reports. So I'm doing it somewhat in an order I think that makes sense is, first of all, how long would you expect to have to work on the report? Um, for getting your annual report done? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, it depends on how well organized you've been all year. <laughs> and, you know, if, if you have been doing things, but not a lot of documentation, 
it it could take you several days to pull everything together because you're going to have to go back and and like I said, you're going to have to research things. You're going to have to collect information. You're going to have to be in touch with your evaluator. You're going to have to do a lot of groundwork to have the information you need to do the report. However, if you've set up your data collection systems and you've been doing a good job of documentation as you go along, then it's not going to take you nearly as long and could possibly be done in as short as a day. Um, so it, it really it depends a lot on you and your organizational skills. Um, Pam, I might ask you to even speak to this because um, as a PI, I observed that you were one of the best organized PIs in terms of having that information ready when it came time for your annual reports. And, you know, my very first annual report 12 or 13 years ago, I think I panicked way too much because I didn't know what was expected. So I've shared the template in the chat. Look ahead of time. If you got an email on April 1st, look at it now to see what's involved. The other is keep track of how many events you had, who attended them, evaluation results. I read somewhere, and I could not find it again, that they say allow about 10 hours to work on your report. And I think by the time I got to my ones after I tracked information, I could sit and do it in one day. I didn't submit it in one day, but I had all the information and I could fill it out, send it to my co-PIs and other people on my campus to get their input and everything. So tracking your information from day one, communicating with your evaluator will speed up the process a lot. Do not wait. If July 1st is your date, don't wait till June 28th to um, start it. You are going to have a lot of problems, which does bring us to the next question. Hopefully Elaine answered it, but if not, please add it back into the chat of when that first report is due. It's not the 90 days. It's not the day you get the first notice. It is, Elaine, you said, what, about six uh, weeks we would be? We recommend that you set your personal internal deadline for submission within that 90-day window, a month to six weeks prior to the anniversary date of your award. So if you received your award effective July the 1st, then you're backing up to June 1st and then the, into the middle of May. So from the middle of May to the 1st of June would be the internal time frame I would personally set for getting my annual report done. That gives you a little extra time in case, you know, you're having trouble getting a little bit of information. Um, or once you submit it for your program officer to get back with you with additional questions, should that be necessary? And so as a result, I would report everything through April 30th using Elaine's scenario. So you're really reporting it for your first 10 months of your grant. But that is, you can make the cutoff dates as you want. There's nothing written in stone other than it would have to be done by July 1st. But the final annual report, does that also get submitted before the due date? Yes. No. You actually submit your final annual report within 90 days of when your grant ends, correct? Right. Well, I thought I'm sorry, I asked my question due wrong. Date. Yeah, I thought that yeah. was the due date. Okay, yeah. Um, well, yeah, it is a due date of your award date. Yeah, right. And it, and it depends from a lot. The, the, there were, I think there was a question in chat I saw pop up having to do with the difference in the annual and the final. Um, one of the things that can happen with that final report is a no-cost extension. And once you once you get a if you get a no cost extension for your grant, then that changes that 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 um, scenario so that you go from having um, a report that's due associated with a project closeout, which is a different timeline, than a report that's due on the annual reporting deadline. And so that's it, it is just a little confusing. But just know that you can always reach out to us and we can help you figure out what you're supposed to do and when you're supposed to do it. Okay. And I have two questions I think I'm going to address to Kaylin and then I'm going to go on so we make sure we get through everything. First of all, Kaylin, um, if they're changing co-PIs or um, PIs or changing personnel, when do you want to hear about that? Is that on their report or at as soon as they know, or what is the timeline you would recommend for that? And that they wanted to know where should they put that they change your co-PI on their annual report? 
Yeah, thank you, Pam. So generally, if you're making a change in your CoPI or PI, you should inform your uh, program officer as soon as you know that that's happening. And then you actually need to submit um, a, a request in research.gov to make that change. So there are some steps to that that are outside of the annual report process. So then when your report comes around, um, comes time for your report, uh, then you also want to include that in the changes a portion of your report so that it's also documented there. So there's a few additional steps with making a change in personnel. Uh, Kaylin, you might just want to talk just a minute about um about those changes. A change in PI or co-PI is not trivial. Nope. Um, the qualifications of those individuals were part of the intellectual merit that got your project funded. Your program officer is probably gonna want a bio sketch mm -hmm. for the replacement person. They're gonna need to give consideration to whether that person, they believe that person is going to be uh, the right person for your project has the right qualifications and experience to help you be successful. You can't just arbitrarily put somebody in that slot. So, Kaylin, could you address that? Absolutely. So, certainly for a change of PI, that um, can be considered a major change in your project. So, you are in, in should be in communication with your program director and um, having conversations about the qualifications and expertise that are needed to make that exchange and make the replacement. Um, so there's some, there's usually some informal dialogue that's going on generally through email, but could be a Zoom call if needed to really flesh out what, what's gonna happen there. And then it needs to be officially uh, requested in the research.gov system where you'll be asked to upload uh, a bio sketch for the, the new PI. Um, the process is pretty much the same uh, for a co-PI. I would just say that it's a little more common for co-PIs to, to leave projects um, and to be uh, replaced. So there's the similar process. Um, however, it's just a little more common. Uh, so all of that is going on outside of this annual reporting, um, but it should be noted in your annual report that, that this has happened. So it's really after you've made the changes um, and notified the program officer, your annual report would not give them, again, as we mentioned, I think a, two or three times, no surprises for a program officer. The first time they hear about a change of personnel or other major things should not be in the annual report. Uh, and one other question, and we will get to other ones or you'll be able to email us later. But this was a difficulty when I did my first report. Where do I put things? Do I go under significant results, key outcomes, major accomplishments? Um, should I repeat them five times in my report to make sure they're there every single time? I think they might be appropriate. Kaylin, uh, you look ready oh, to answer. So you can pick one of those boxes to report your major results, whatever term you would like to um, select there. So there keep in mind that the the annual report template is used agency wide so for all of our programs not just in the edu directorate but in all of the directorates so there are there is some different types of language that are used that might speak to different groups at different times and so you can go ahead and select um one of those boxes to you know really inform us of your significant results or key outcomes, whatever it is that you choose, to, uh, whichever box you choose to, to use, but you do not need to repeat it in all of the boxes, especially if it's the same text. Okay. And we've had a couple of really good questions that I might even have to ask people to email us individually because it reflects their condition, because we want to make sure we get also a little bit about the outcomes report, but otherwise at the end of today, we will have another question and answer period. So Kaylin, I am going to let you right now talk about the outcomes report, but please keep putting your questions in. And if we didn't get something answered, let us know. Oh, okay. So the- Sorry, Caitlin. <laughs> I misunderstood. 
The final outcomes report. So this is um, a, one of the three types of reports that I mentioned that um, that you submit along with your final report, your final annual report. Um, and this is a report that I think I mentioned earlier is facing outwards to the public. And so it's written in a format that um, that is acceptable for, for that uh, context. Um, again, in terms of timing, you're, uh, you should be uh, submitting this along with that final report, and those are due no later than 120 days following the end of the grant period in and of itself. So you have a little bit of time after the project finishes to get this final outcomes report submitted, and then it gets posted to the um, uh, outward facing to the public. Um, when you submit the final outcomes report, you are signaling to NSF that this is the end of your award. And so it's exactly when you submit that, that you, the, the project will be closed. And it is very, very challenging to open the project. So we advise you that you that you that if there's any question about whether you have additional funds to spend or um, other, other considerations, then really check in with your program director to make sure that that this is something that you should do. Um, so again, if you have funds that are unspent um, and you're in a time frame where you can consider a no cost extension, uh, then you might want to open up a dialogue with your program officer to see if that's a possibility. But but keep in mind that when you press go on that, that it is the it it does end your project. All right, in terms of timing here, um, there's the awards, here's our, our figure again. Um, we've got the, the end date, the award start date, the end date there, um, and then we have that submission window I just referred to. So it's 120 days past the end date. So it's a little different timeline for the final, final reporting. Um, and then at that point, at 120 days post your end of project date, your um, final project report and your um, uh, your outcomes report become overdue and you'll, you'll get emails about that. Um, so let's see, uh, broad general, so yeah, just be sure to the project is is submitted before the or is done before the submission. And Kaylin, if you don't mind my interrupting, no, um, I, I, I encourage you to double check with your business office. Um, you may think you're through with the project, but depending on how quickly or slowly things flow through your business office in terms of paying bills and that sort of thing. You need to make sure that they have they have cleared their accounts and are not expecting any more money from NSF or will need any more reimbursement from NSF related to your project before you hit that submit button. Um, that, that's um, they will be very upset with you if you submit that <laughs> if you submit that final report and close the grant out and they still anticipated drawing down more money from NSF. So uh, you really need to coordinate with your business office on that final action. Absolutely. I would just say in general to stay, you know, really have a good accounting of your funds at that point. I mean, throughout, you need to have a good accounting of your funds, but really towards the end uh, to make sure that you do not miss out on the opportunity to spin down all your funds. That is the goal. I'm sure that's the goal of, of most PIs and, and institutions, but it's also the goal of NSF that you spend all your funds. We really don't want them to come back to us. Um, they are generally not very useful at that point to other two-year colleges or to, they don't get reused in a, in, a, in a way that we would hope they would be used. So please, um, you know, uh, keep a good accounting, especially towards the end. And, and like Elaine said, be be coordinating with your business office. That's a, a really great uh, reminder. Um, the project outcome reports are not reviewed or approved by NSF. So these are, uh, once you push go, they uh, are, uh, you know, they're, they're approved uh, right away and they end up on the website. Um, so be sure to, that you're um, really editing these reports uh, and polishing these reports and making them really ready for um, an outward facing to the public. 
Uh, and you should receive that final notification notification that the project outcomes report uh, was submitted successfully. And that's how you know that it's been that it's been done and then your project is is officially over. Um, there's a disclaimer that will be added to uh, the project outcomes report that's on the website that basically the NSF has not approved or endorsed its content. Um, so just know that uh, that that's uh, that you that what you write there is not going to be analyzed or looked at by program officers or any staff at NSF. Um, and so you want to make sure that the content is exactly how you want it to be, uh, and it will live in, in, on NSF's website for, for the foreseeable future. Okay, so when your final outcomes report is submitted, it does become a public document. You will want it to be perfect. Write and edit and then cut and paste the final version into research.gov. The report need not be very long. Don't feel that you must use the maximum 800 words. What you say is much more important than how much you say. The report should be exactly what the title says, outcomes. You will want to focus only on the problem you addressed and what resulted from your efforts in terms of the intellectual merit and broader impacts of the work. As a result of your NSF ATE funding, what happened? What changed? What um, you will find the controls for report submission at the bottom of the screen, which includes save, save and submit, or cancel commands. You can have attachments with your outcomes report. Images are not required. However, you may upload as many as six images with your final outcomes report. The images will appear small, so action photos of no more than one or two students, and simple graphics work best. It is nice to include a project logo if you have one. Keep in mind that the images should reflect the participants served or outcomes achieved. The images must be less than eight megabytes, and the images should be in landscape format where the width exceeds the height. Acceptable file types are shown on the screen and include JPG, JPEG, GIF, BMP, PNG, and TIFF. You must provide a copyright release for all uploaded images. This is a sample of an outcomes report for a three-year ATE grant. Note the specifics. This report is 382 words. As I mentioned earlier, it isn't necessary to use the 800, entire 800 word allotment. There are multi-million dollar projects that may need that many words, but for a smaller ATE project, this sample at about 400 words is probably a good length. It was reviewed by multiple people before the PI submitted the report. Most important, the report is clearly focused on project outcomes. Prepare your final outcomes report to be distributed as a PR piece for your college to demonstrate the impact of your ATE grant on students, faculty, the college, your regional industry, and economic development. It is not necessary to explain how you've done what you've done. Focus just on what resulted from that work. Point out the features of the project and impacts that best demonstrate why the project was a good use of public funds. Take advantage of NSF's guide for preparing final outcomes report that is provided in research.gov. I would encourage you to be creative in using your annual and final outcomes reports. These reports are great for communicating with stakeholders, marketing your program and work, and for results of prior support for future grant proposals. For communication with stakeholders, a synopsis of your annual report content can serve as an executive summary for an internal advisory group, if you have one, administrators or others internal to the organization who need to be kept in the loop. Ask if your grant professional wants a full copy of your annual report for the college. Your annual report may be printed from research.gov, but unfortunately, the formatting does not make the document very attractive. Also, the full report can be too long to serve your internal dissemination purposes. 
This is why we suggest that you use the content to create a short, concise executive summary for sharing. A summary will also help you communicate with those external to your organization. For marketing, when it comes time to create your outcomes report, it's a good idea to consult with your college public relations and marketing department. This outward facing report will be a public reflection of your institution as well as your project. So you want to make sure that both are reflected in the best possible way. Colleges almost always do press releases when the institution receives an NSF award. It's good to issue another one to let your local audience know what happened as a result of that award. The third really important use of your summary outcome report is for reporting results of prior support for your next NSF grant proposal. A synthesis of outcomes with metrics written in terms of intellectual merit and broader impacts is exactly what you will need to meet the requirements in your next proposal. So this concludes the information we wanted to share with you today. But before we conclude the webinar, we want to see if you have additional questions. Pam? Okay, and we definitely have had several questions. So in respect of the time, I am going to ask Emery also to put up the poll so that you, people can completing the poll as we answer the questions, if you would, Emery. But first of all, Kaylin um, and Elaine, both of you, what sort of attachments would people um, have? For example, and this is both for their annual report and their final outcomes report, should they attach a letter of commitment from an employer that shows that they really did what they said? Should they attach, Elaine, you mentioned a logo or a copy of a flyer that they did. Um, there's, you can have up to six attachments, I think at different places. You have to do your evaluator's report. What else are you looking for, Kaylin, or what would you suggest, Elaine? Well, for the outcomes report, um, you do not want a lot of nitty gritty. Uh, you're, you're, this is information for essentially a soundbite audience. And so you know, it's where a picture you know, tells a thousand words, two students, you know, working in whatever technology it is that you're doing that you can, you know, that shows them like the discipline that you're in. You know, maybe they're working on a solar panel. Maybe they're working on an electric vehicle, whatever it is, or in a, in a biotech lab, but something that's very, because these are little tiny it's got to be very, uh, very close up and, and show the technology so that they can look and say, oh, yeah, this is this is STEM. This is science. This is engineering. This is technology. Uh, a logo that kind of identifies you is fine. A graphic that might show enrollment increases or diversity changes that have been positive or some other outcome like that. But just very succinct. And just think about your tax paper. So if you were looking at a report from someone else, what, you know, what would speak to you? What would tell you very quickly uh, what, what happened in that report and why this is important, why you're glad your tax dollars went to that? The annual report's a whole different story. And I'll let Kaylin speak to the kinds of things that program officers might be interested in. This does get a little bit more down into the nitty gritty of your project, you know, and could include you know, your advisory board agendas or, or meeting notes or something, you know, I'm not sure how much detail you, the program officers would like to see there. This is really going to vary across projects and programs. So please know that there's um, not a, a comprehensive list that I could provide at this moment, but I can give some examples. Um, so a lot of times what we see in which is very useful to to supporting the annual reports are things like uh, if, for example, you publish your results um, or maybe a figure from a, a, a very significant figure from um, a report or a, a presentation that you want to share or, or perhaps even the whole presentation. So if you've given a talk um, at a conference, that's a that that could you could include the PowerPoint. Um, uh, let's see, or poster, if, if those can kind of be nice supplements to seeing how you're disseminating your work and, and putting all the results together in one place. So those are the types of things, that, but there could be other um, items. Uh, as Elaine mentioned, there could be agendas or flyers of, of events. Um, 
So it kind of depends on what it is that you've been doing over the course of the year and um, what you think might support some of your outcomes in your report. So uh, usually they're considered supporting documents. Um, we do open them. We love to see them, especially if they support the the work that it, that you're doing and kind of make it come alive for us a little bit more. But you're not expecting letters from someone saying, they're not lying on their annual report. Someone asked, do they have to have an evident, a letter of evidence that they really did an event or anything? And no, no I, I was going to say, that, you know, I think we talk so much about commitment letters to show employers are involved <laughs> in the proposal that people are going, but I have employers involved, um, but it's not documentary evidence of that is not required. You know, there's a lot of questions about funding of, uh, or like at the end, do you, does your business office have to do a report um, also when the funding ends? And that's really a little bit beyond the scope of this webinar um, in that it gets longer. So if you have those questions, if you'll email them to Mentor Connect, um, we'll work at getting the answers for some of those for you. Um, but Real briefly, it's just really for the PI, they have their annual report and then they have their final outcomes report. Um, and someone asked, can I request money during that time for my final outcomes? And the biggest party lane you mentioned, they have to have all the budgetary in and submitted and reimbursed before they submit that report, correct? That's correct. And, and if, you know, if you're looking at your finances, as was pointed out, you know, uh, NSF really, really wants you to use this money to do the work that you're doing. And so pay attention to the finances. And if you have money remaining uh, and you've had one no cost extension and for whatever reason you still have money, you're going to have money left at the end. Don't feel that you must close your brain out. Contact your program officer. It is possible to get a second no cost extension. They would much rather you continue advancing technician education with the, with the project that you're working on and doing more of what's worked and what you, you know, using what you've learned um, than to, to, to leave any of that money on the table, as they say. They want it to be used for the purpose it was awarded for. So uh, pay, pay attention to that and, and use this money wisely um, before you close your project out. I don't know if this was said, but the no cost, the first no cost extension is grantee approved. So it just requires a simple request in research.gov for a no cost extension. And there's no real approval process there. It's grantee approved. A program director will uh, review it, but it's just a review. And since most of you are doing your first report, and you're sitting there going, what are they talking about of the extension? It is that some of people attending today's webinar are in their last year of the grant, and you have an option in research.gov to request a no cost extension. It means that you still have work to do. You don't get more funds, but you can spend the rest of it. Um, for those of you who are going, what are they talking about? I'm six months into my grant. We'll talk and let you know more about that as you go on in the next couple of years. But it is in research.gov. And if I remember right, is it just kind of a box that you check and then add an explanation to it? It's really fairly easy to do. It is easy, but you need to wait until you're about 90 days out from the from the end of that that um to the anniversary date of your funding award. And that's that's when you should request In the it. last year. So it's really when your grant's about to come year. to an end. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who just started funding in 2024 or 2023, it's not something you need to be thinking about mm -hmm. yet. Know that it's a possibility down, excuse me, down the road. The one warning I'll give is you just don't want to get to your end date before you make the request. And we have that happen on very rarely, but um, it's hard to reverse that. So you should make the request. Um, I think it's at least 45 days before the end date, but 90 would be better. So, but you can't do it too soon. You cannot. Yet. You can't do it too <laughs> soon. So there's, there is sort of a sweet spot there. Right. Right. Um, for it. So, but like I said, for, I know that when I first started my grant, 
people talking about these extensions or supplemental, all of that's beyond the scope of what we're doing today. But for those of you who had questions about it, we're more than happy if you send us an email to answer or help you with them. It, um, you know, don't want to get too far off track of what our focus is today. And if I have not, oh, um, one question, if it is a consortium project, does everyone have to file an annual report or is it one annual report? Everybody has to file one, but you want your content to be the same. There are going to be some project, there's information about the awardee, each, each of the a collaborative partners is an, is, has an award. There's going to be information about that reward, award recipient. So your organization, your people, your PIs, and all of that are going to be in, unique to your award. Then the content of that report should be coordinated between the two so that those two reports are the same. Um, Kayla, there may be something else you'd like to add to that. No, that's perfect. I, I, the content is the same and everybody should definitely submit one. Uh, you will begin to get the overdue messages if not. And I will say, you know, we are a little bit over the time, so we know people are leaving. Um, thank you so much for completing the evaluation for everyone who did that. And we do, um, again, want to thank you for attending. And I think we answered all the questions. I know that there is a lot of stress over exactly when people have to have the reports in. And so if we did not clarify those, please send us an email again with what your due date, you know, when you started getting the notice, when it is, and we'll help you figure out the best date for it. Because I think my biggest panic when I got the grant was trying to figure out when do I do this report? It says it's due now. And I also happen to have ours due over Christmas. So the email came over Christmas break and I was getting calls from uh, my AOR going, do you know you have a report due? And so anyway, um, if you have questions, definitely let us know on that. And otherwise, again, thanks to everyone for attending the webinar. We really do appreciate it.